Um, you know, we, we I'll talk a little bit about policy because I know you, you got here to talk a lot about policy, but any of y'all want to hear a little bit about the game last night? <laughs> so we practice every morning at 6 o'clock in the morning. Like, this is Roger Williams' thing. I am not a morning person, but we all get there at 6 in the morning, and uh, it's like he's regimented. He's got this thing running, humming. We've got a few new players, so, you know, I don't know if any of y'all know this, we, we lost the majority last year. It's rough. Uh, but we still got some new members. And uh, I, I tell the whole freshman class, I said, you know, none of you are my favorite new member of Congress. And they're all looking at me like really weird. I said, AOC is my favorite new member of Congress. <laughs> now they get it. They ain't really uh, understand that. And, uh, but yet nobody knows who they are because they get so overshadowed by uh, by the four, you know, three or four members of the new class. And yet they got some incredible, incredible new members, really, really sharp, smart. Uh, you had to be tough to win in the cycle last year as a Republican, and they are. And, and a lot of them bring just incredible backgrounds, incredible talents. But some of them bring really good baseball skills. And um, very few people knew about it until last night. And you got to see Anthony Gonzalez out there. Um, I do, I think, what is a congressional baseball first. I don't think an NFL player's ever hit to another NFL player before. <laughs> and uh, the Democrats, what was, who's the Democrat that played for, yeah, all red for, I uh, <clears throat> think played for the Tennessee Titans. And he just crushes his ball to center field and everybody else is nervous. And I'm like, Anthony Gonzalez can literally cover the entire outfield. Like, you don't need a center field or left field or right field, just Anthony. And, um, and you saw him like running around like a gazelle out there. And so sure enough, he goes and he makes the out. And uh, he, um, he had run a, an in the park home run uh, one time and the only impediment was the guy on third, I think it was Jack Bergman on third, almost got run over because he wasn't running <laughs> fast enough. And, uh, and so then Roger asks me, he said, you know, last year I was, I was you know, the, the star second baseman. I literally played for two plays, and, uh, you know, one of them turned out to be a little bit uh, noteworthy. But um, then they pull me out, you know, okay, great. I leave the game last year, zero to zero. We ended up losing like 21 to five. Like I'm telling the rest of these guys, like, how? How can a guy who needs crutches to walk become the MVP of our team? <laughs> it tells you a lot about our team. And, um, initially, Roger came and asked if I would be a pinch runner last night. And, uh, I, I chose to just go the other route and be, <laughs> but you think about that one for a second. <laughs> You're like, really? He did? Like, it's not that bad. Um, but then he asked me to bat. And so uh, I had, we'd been practicing in practice at 6 in the morning. And I had this new member, William Timmons. I don't know if y'all are related. Great new member from South Carolina, uh, but just speedy as a rabbit. And in fact, his nickname is the Swamp Rabbit. So, um, you know, we tagged him with this early. He, he fits the bill. And so Roger comes to me last week and he says, I'd like you to be the leadoff batter. I said, Roger, it's really nice. Uh, I don't know if you know, but I can't run. <laughs> like, I would need to hit, literally hit a home run in order to be able to make it to first base. And he goes, no, 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 we're going to let you do a, a pinch runner. And I said, well, the only condition is I need the Swamp Rabbit to be my pinch runner. So <laughs> they loved the stories back home in Louisiana. I've got, like, great stories written because, you know, the Swamp Rabbit. And, and so they're writing about this. And they call Timmons, and Timmons gives these great interviews. You know, I'm like, you're getting great press back home in Louisiana. I don't know how it's going in South Carolina. But, uh, and then, so sure enough, he gets on base for me, and he scores the first run. So we, we had a lot of fun. We were competitive for a while. We got a win next year. Kevin Brady and I were up until two in the morning last night talking about, you know, the tweaks we need to make. So it, it never ends. <laughs> There's a lot of trash talking in the game, and most of that is within the Republican dugout. <laughs> we had a lot of injuries, so we started like in, in March. You know, the Democrats started about like three weeks ago because they just need Cedric. If one guy, you know, as long as Cedric's practicing in February, everybody else just takes the rest of the year off. And then, they come together and just figure out what uniforms they're going to wear. And so we're practicing as a team. And, and so we ended up getting a bunch of guys injured. You know, so they could be, and I told Roger, like, this is how long our season was. We had guys that got injured, got healed up again, and then got injured again. It was such like a cycle. And so uh, Trent Kelly was one of the guys on injured reserve. And we had a few other people, if you heard. We had, like, heart attacks and pulled muscles and all kind of stuff. It was, you know, the, it's a, like when you're playing in the major leagues, 
their injuries are a lot different when they're like 20 year old kids. When it's 60 and 70 year old people, we did have one senator, Rand Paul, who's the youngest senator by far, I think, you know, in his age. The rest of them need walkers to get, you know, the first. <laughs> so we, we had this injured reserve list. So I just, I gave Trent a 12 pack of beer and I said, You're in charge of the injured reserve guys in the dugout. And everybody else was focused on the game. But no, it was a lot of fun. Uh, we, we really do, it's great camaraderie, it's great. To, to get to know your colleagues on the Republican side really well. Uh, but even on the Democrat side, we, we build great relationships. And it really does lead over onto the, uh, the policy side. When you're able to work with Democrats and there are opportunities all the time, uh, it's real easy to, you know, I, I know Mike Doyle well. Mike's now the, uh, the chair of the technology subcommittee that I still serve on on energy and commerce. I had to give up my other subcommittees when I got into leadership, but I love technology. I love, it's, it's what I used to do for a living. And, working really closely, in fact, uh, with Anna Eshoo on a video deregulation bill. Mm. And Mike Doyle is the chairman of the committee, and we've talked a number of times about, uh, about that. And, and we have a really good relationship. Of course, Cedric and I, uh, our relationship goes back to our days in the State House. Great, uh, great bond that we formed there. And it's carried over here. And you know, he's in leadership on the Democrat side, mm. and I'm in leadership on the Republican side. And so you'd think, you know, I mean, we have our clashes on policy, but we've never had um, never had any clashes uh, in terms of our relationship because we know where each other's uh, philosophy is and, and respect each other's differences and because of that we're able to work together and, and Jim mentioned uh, we had a few other amendments three amendments passed last week on the energy and water bill and uh, Cedric and I are undefeated on the house floor in amendments so you know the, the secret is there if you want to be undefeated just team up with Cedric but uh, <laughs> we, we do have there was one time where we had an amendment on the House floor, something really important to, to dredging in the Mississippi River, create more opportunities to, to capitalize on the Panama Canal widening. And so we come up with this great idea, it's really good for the economy, and we brought everybody together. The chairman of the Appropriations Committee and the ranking member of the Appropriations Committee, Republican and Democrat, both came together against our amendment. And so I went to Cedric and, you know, in this, this point we were in the majority and, uh, you know, I said, okay, Cedric, this was before I was in leadership. I said, we've got all of our leadership against us. You're going to have to help me deliver a lot of votes and we're going to pass this amendment. And, uh, and sure enough, we did. We passed it over the objection of both the chairman and the ranking member. I don't know how often that happens, but uh, we did it. It was a lot of fun when you win those. Uh, you know, they, they weren't as excited about it, but they're, they're more willing to work with us now when we bring amendments because like, we don't want to get beat on the floor again against you guys. Uh, and so it shows you, I mean, that there, there is still that opportunity to work together and it's real and it happens a lot more than you think. Um, I love telling people that come to Washington that don't know how this town works and all they see is what, what happens and you know what people think happens based on how the news and the media reports it. And you know, y'all understand this, y'all know how this town can work and you know, we all know where the fights are and, and the big high profile issues are the ones that get all the attention. And that's where, you know, geez, it's immigration, and the Republicans are here, and the Democrats are there. It's health care. It's tax cuts. You know, it used to be if you wanted to cut people's taxes, everybody was for it. Now, just Republicans are for it. Democrats are against it. I'd rather be in our party if that's where, you know, the dividing line falls. But if you look at that <clears throat> from afar, it just looks like, you know, if people ask, you know, can you guys ever work on anything uh, that you can get done that people care about? And I tell them a lot of different things I go through. But, you know, I'll hit a few. I mean, 21st Century Cures was a really, really important piece of legislation that will save millions of lives uh, just a few years from now. We're already hearing about cures to major diseases already, and it's only two years on the books. And I think you're going to see big cures for diseases like uh, cancer or Alzheimer's or ALS because of that bill. But yet it got no attention because Republicans and Democrats came together. We were in the majority as Republicans, and Barack Obama was president. And I use this example a lot when we talk about things like USMCA or other important issues where, okay, you've got one party in power and the presidents of a different party, you know, and there's some people that just don't want to give the president a win on anything. And I said, look, there were a lot of things we disagreed with Barack Obama on. It's very well noted. You can go and look at the issues, and they were important issues where we had disagreements. Uh, you, First of all, should never make those disagreements personal. But when you do have an opportunity to do something good for the country, even if the 
president of the other party is going to get credit for it. Who cares? If it's the right thing to do, you do the right thing. And that was an example of where we did. A Republican Congress came together and worked with Barack Obama. It was probably one of the very last bills that he signed as president. And let him get all the credit. If we save millions of people's lives, uh, you will be able to point to that and see it. But it got no attention. Nobody knows about it. And every day we do bills like that. You know, we just renewed the National Flood Insurance Program again. We're working on a long-term reauthorization. Hopefully in the House we pass the five-year reauth soon. Uh, we work on a lot of other issues like that, uh, but nobody knows about that, and it's Republicans and Democrats coming together to solve problems for everyday families. And we need to do more of it. We need to remind people and ourselves of those examples just to keep everybody's memory fresh that it can happen and it does happen, and when it happens, you will never hear about it back home. And, and I do think it, it changes people's perception and understanding of what goes on up here when they see that, because it, the only things they see are those, those big fights, and yet the vast majority of bills we pass are bipartisan. People are shocked when they hear that. You know, and you know, you know, a lot of them are maybe mundane to, to everyday people. It's not the things they see every day, uh, but it's the, the workings of government, the inner workings of government, and a lot of times things that, that help get, get red tape out of people's way. And we've seen what we've done on the economy, not just the tax cuts, but uh, getting regulations under control. It's amazing how when you go across the country, when you talk to small businesses back home, uh, they love the tax cuts and they'll tell you what they're doing to hire more people. It's not millionaires and billionaires going off and buying islands and yachts and all that. It's, it's small business owners that are hiring three more people or in the case of Gnarly Barley from Hammond, Louisiana, a small brewery, a very fast-growing brewery, by the way, uh, but they were literally a shop of six people. They couldn't even afford health care benefits for their employees. And when we did the tax cut bill, uh, not your traditional Republican-looking business, I mean, a small microbrewery in Hammond, Louisiana, a couple who met at Southeastern University and decided we want to pursue this dream and risked everything like every small business does, and they're literally just scraping it all together, and every time they make money, they're buying more products to uh, manufacturing equipment to make more beer. And lo and behold, now they're one of the fastest growing breweries in the country. And they used the savings from the tax cut bill to hire more workers, to increase production, to give health care benefits to their employees, and to start a 401k program for their employees. They were able to do all this because of the tax cut bill. And even just as importantly, they were willing to talk about it publicly because, unfortunately, you see some on the left that anytime somebody says something positive about the bill and how it helps their company, they get ravished on the left. And I've seen that too. Uh, and that's a shame because we ought to celebrate good things happening to people, whether they're a Republican or Democrat business. Nobody cares about that. We sure don't care about that. We want everybody to have more opportunities and look at the results in our country right now. When you see the lowest unemployment in every sector you can pick, Everybody really is benefiting from this. A lot of people, when you look at polling, don't realize it's because of the tax cut bill. They might not realize when you're getting $20 more in your paycheck or $50 more in your paycheck. It's easy to get that lost in the shuffle along the way, and at the end of the year, you have an extra 1000 or $2,000. And that's equating to people being able to go out and take vacations or pay down their student loans or do other things that, that just improve their regular daily lives. And so it's exciting to see that. We get to see it. A lot, I get to hear those stories and it never gets old. Uh, but it, it's something we ought to continue telling people because it reminds us if we get things right up here, it really does matter for people back home. That's why they send us up here. And we need to tell those stories more to remind us when we're doing big things, when we're having big battles. Uh, why are we having the battle? Don't have the battle because you don't like somebody else. You know, if it's really important, if you have a strong philosophy and you're over here and the other side's over there, go and Cash out your differences, and eventually you can probably find a way to put some of your things on the side. And you know, Anna Ashu and I do not see eye to eye on every aspect of video regulation, but we put our points on the side where we have big disagreements, and we just focused on the thing we have agreement on. And we can hopefully reform a law that goes back to 1992 that governs the way that you receive video content. I mean, believe it or not. Things in 1992, the way you got content, are a whole lot different today. You didn't have satellite. You didn't have fiber. Uh, you didn't have any competition. It was one cable company monopoly negotiating against the local broadcast monopoly, 
and, and if you had some cable channel options, uh, it was channels you've never heard of. I mean, ESPN started off as a hockey station. And for E, that's a, he gets excited when I talk about hockey. For most of America, that's not why they watch ESPN today. Sorry, they still show some hockey. But um, that's why they got started. But all of a sudden, everything changed, and you started seeing competition in, in the cable space, and then you saw competition with fiber and satellite, and then all of a sudden the internet came along, and you can see more content on this than you can even do on your home TV, and yet the laws that govern each of those different platforms are completely different. And it makes no sense to the person watching it. They don't want eight different sets of rules or some FCC uh, bureaucrat that they can't even name. I love a Jeep pie, but they're not the ones that are supposed to be determining all of this. It should be Congress setting the rules of the game for everybody so that you don't have to, gee was I've got to hope that the FCC does the right thing. Uh, let's focus on what we can do working together to solve the problems that we face. And uh, if one last thing I'll talk about is in the energy space because uh, I come from South Louisiana. I get to see it all the time. But more and more people now are realizing just how powerful the energy industry is, not only to our country. It's a huge sector of our country. It's a growing sector. Many, many states now are in the energy business that didn't think they would be because of technology, American technology, you know, shale alone, and what we're able to do to create manufacturing and bring back manufacturing to America where you have stable prices, lower prices for energy, uh, lower carbon emissions, by the way. Every country, if you go to Europe, you know, all these Europeans going, hey, you got to get in the Paris Accord. Let me tell you, please show me one country in Europe that is in compliance with the Paris Accord. One, name one, anybody. There is not one country in Europe that signed the Paris Accord that's in compliance, including France, where Paris is located. <laughs> not one, they can't, even, they can't even come up and compete and match uh, the, the actual uh, hits, the targets that they set for themselves. And then they want us to get in it. And it's wrecked their manufacturing base. We're bringing back manufacturing in America. We're creating millions more jobs. We've got higher wages for workers. Anybody who wants a job can get a job today, in large part because of how dominant our energy sector is. And with all that, we're bringing down our carbon emissions without signing any of these pacts that wreck your economy. And the president went down to the Sempra Energy Facility in Lake Charles, Louisiana, a few weeks ago. I got to go with him. It was really exciting. He was really excited about it because he got to see up close and personal just how important these policies that we make up here are at creating jobs. It's a $10 billion private facility, one facility. And one of the partnerships is with Japan. And I know the ambassador knows this well. Our friends like Japan and Poland and other countries that used to have to get their natural gas from Russia can now get it from America. It's great for our economy. It creates really good jobs here in America. But you know what else it does? It creates a stable source of energy for our friends around the world that don't have to get that energy from Russia, a country who puts strings attached to the energy that they provide, uh, who has a much better working relationship and builds stronger partnerships with a friendly nation instead of having to get it from a hostile nation. That's what we're doing with smart policies. And it's good to see it. It's good to go meet the workers. The president loves meeting these blue collar workers. And you know what else? They love meeting him. To see the excitement when these workers are just waiting hours in the hot sun because they want to see the president of the United States and what he's done to bring manufacturing back and create jobs. And some of them told their stories about how they had given up. Some of those people you hear about, the millions of people, that got back into the workforce, some of them were there telling those stories about how they were on unemployment. They couldn't provide for their family. Now they're able to not only have a career, they're buying their, their first house, they're starting a family. Uh, these policies are important to real people. We've got to get it right up here. And when we do, it's really exciting to go back home in the real world when you leave this bubble and see how it's having a positive impact on people's lives. So, I look forward to working on a lot of these other things, getting USMCA done, maybe getting infrastructure done, whatever else we can get done if we can come together. And we need to come together more because there are still big problems out there that people are counting on us to solve. So I appreciate what Ripon does to help focus and push and promote those good policies. And uh, you all are not just nice, fun people to work with, but uh, you also fight for the things that really are important to real people back in the real world. So. Uh, with that, Jim, I guess we can take some questions. But Fantastic. thank you for having thank me you. this morning.